Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. Today's guest is David Doig presently the CEO of Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives, whose efforts have led to the Whole Foods Retail in Englewood and Whole Foods Warehousing in Pullman, the National Historic Designation of Pullman, and the building and financing of Millennium Park downtown. We began our conversation getting the background on Dave's entry into real estate, city planning, and finance. Thanks for being here, first of all. Sure. Um, I, I'm calling your your episode uh, "Doing Well, Doing Well While Doing Good," uh, and I think, you know, I think that your your story actually mirrors really, really well the uh, episode I just recorded with the guy who basically saved the entire campus of the Pabst uh, Brewing Empire up there in Milwaukee. I don't know if you've you've ever seen it, but it's just breathtaking. No. 30 buildings on uh, 23 acres, I think, of, you know, the middle of the downtown. Hmm. And, um, well, God, he rescued, you know, he just rescued it with a $50,000 down payment with a X amount of time to get an $11 million buyer. It's, it's quite a story. And, you know, now, That's great. now mm-hmm. it's got the Milwaukee Bucks new stadium just opened up, you know, a, a nine iron away. It's just, it's oh, wow. Cool. It's a great, okay. great story. Um, <clears throat> Just, I mean, I know you, I know your family and that sort of thing, but I, I, I really don't know, I really don't know that much about your, your entry into the, into the business, into the whole discipline. I mean, when, when you, mm-hmm. headed, when you headed off to college, what, what was your dream? What was your major? What were your yeah. you know, plans yeah. for a musician's kid? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, uh, went to Wheaton college and, uh, uh, was a history major, Thinking um, that uh, I would probably end up um, going to law school and, and being a lawyer, and um, actually that that kind of changed between my uh, between my sophomore and junior year. I did a I did an internship at uh, one of the church on the west side, and um, and that kind of changed my uh, ideas about uh, what uh, my life plans were, and and uh, so I went back to week and finished. With the history major, and then um, actually went to grad school at the University of Chicago, um, and started working in Lawndale. What was that? What was that um, company that you mentioned for your internship? What did they do? Uh, Lawndale Community Church. So it it was uh, it was a kind of a, a new church. They had just started, and uh, they had opened a health center, and um, were were kind of starting to look at doing some uh, some uh, community development, and. Uh, that's that's uh, that's what I did during the summer. Was basically I led the uh, the uh, after school and summer um, education program. Oh, so you're, uh, you're, this was, you're talking about what's now the Lawndale Community Center and campus. Yeah, Lawndale Community Church. Yeah, okay. that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know it very well. So that, uh, that guy, uh, um, coach, the Green Gordon, coach, yeah. yeah, was your yeah. was your mentor at that time. Exactly. As a law student, did you not think, well, I'd I'd love to be their, I'd love to be a five hundred one c 3s lawyer so I could help them accomplish <laughs> these ends, or did you right away yeah. did you see you know I, and I know all the the land takeover he's done there he owns almost like two blocks of Ogden Avenue, uh, yeah. did you was it right away that you saw the piece of the control of the land that you wanted to be interested in. Yeah, yeah, I, I had uh, I had kind of thought uh, you know maybe maybe I could be more um, impactful and, and have uh, greater influence um, not being a lawyer and saw kind of what was happening um, through the church and and wanted to be involved with more direct community development. Um, so I, I kind of jettisoned the idea of going to law school and focused my attention on community development. 
So, you know, you, uh, when I think of you and, you know, the first business meetings I've had with you, I think a lot of finance and, and the mm-hmm. instruments that you've been involved in in your, in your later career. Did you have a, a finance background too? Did you look no. for an MBA? Was, you know, <laughs> no. no, actually, uh, my, my master's was in, uh, was in public policy at the University of Chicago. So it wasn't, it wasn't through business school or through, um, through a finance program. Um, most of what I've learned um, around, around real estate finance has just been through experience. Yeah, I, I you know, I kind of figured you were a public policy major. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did you, when, when you were going around uh, your your first career choices, and I'm going to come out of college, I mean, did it yeah. ever did it ever strike you that you would have landed in that first part of your career that you're quite you know well known for that you would be administrating that Millennium Park project for the Park District? Did that ever? Yeah, no, I would have never. I, I would have never uh, kind of you know figured that would be kind of where my where my career would uh, would go. Um, so I I spent six work years working in Lawndale. Um, Starting in 1989, after finishing grad school, and I'm uh, sorry, no, it was five years at Lawndale, and started a development corporation there, kind of got things going, and then um, and then I went to work for the city. I, I joined the city in 1994. Uh, I started in the city's housing department, um, and I was head of uh, head of real estate for the housing department, and then um, went to the planning department. I was in the planning department from 97 to 99. I was the first deputy commissioner in planning, and then um, in '99, uh, Mayor Daly appointed me uh, superintendent of the Park District. So I was a superintendent of the Park District from '99 to 2004. So let's th- let's think about those gradations, because a, a, a lot of um, a lot of real estate people are are they're basically going to view the the city government, especially, as an obstruction, right? That it's something I have to overcome. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's really interesting to talk to somebody on the inside of the equation and just get your your progress. Through. Yeah. So when when you're in, in, in involved with housing, were you thinking about was was your main focus to develop new affordable housing to take down yes. to take down the disastrous Taylor Homes and Cabrini Green that basically created a ghetto in and among itself. What were your priorities yeah. there? Yeah, my, my portfolio uh, when I was at the Department of Housing was basically all of the uh, city-owned land. Um, and the, the city of Chicago owns, and now they own over 14,000 vacant lots throughout the city. At that time, it was a little over 10,000. And so um, the, uh, the objective was really to find... Um, uh, reuses for those lots, um, and some of them we ended up selling to the adjacent neighbors. Some we ended up uh, uh, working with businesses for parking or or um, other nonprofits, um, and then many of them um, we uh, we ended up um, using to build new housing on. So uh, in the late '90s, we had a uh, program called New Homes for Chicago that uh, developed over. I think it was over 3,000 new new housing units uh, throughout the city, mainly, mainly mainly on the south and west sides, and uh, most of those those homes were built on city-owned lots. When you when the city has a a portfolio of 14,000 houses, and I, I normally think 14,000 lots, lots. They, they, these so, are lots. Yeah, yeah. I know, I normally think of a municipality taking those over because of a tax default or because yes. a bank drops a whole boatload of load of them. What was the yeah. origin of the city controlling 10, 14,000 yeah, lots? Yeah, so, so most of them, I would say probably 70 percent of them were acquired through demo lien foreclosure. So there was a home on them. The city ended up demolishing the home, being the property, and then ended up foreclosing on that demo. And why the city and not the county? Just to help my ignorance. Uh, well, the city the city has uh, the responsibility and the authority um, on uh, dangerous and hazardous buildings to you know to use city um, city authority to um, demolish homes. It's part of their. It's actually part of their police powers uh, and public safety. Okay, so it's not uh, it, the the county though. They're the county would be the entity that would gain real estate tax from these properties. Correct. Once Correct. They, once yeah. they become a quote unquote hazard, it falls into the city's yeah. hands. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the the problem in Cook County is um, uh, you know any single family land affording in a building. 
uh, the um, the time to to uh, acquire through a through a tax foreclosure uh, is a minimum of two and a half years. And you know, by the when, when a building goes vacant, uh, generally it's not gonna it's not gonna last two and a half years if it's if it's uh, vandalized and and uh, you know there's a fire and all those kind of things. So the city was moving much more quickly than the county tax foreclosure process would allow. Now. We actually, when I was in the dorm house, we did the largest uh, uh, non-cash bid on a uh, on a uh, tax reactivation program with the county. We did over 4,000 uh, vacant lots. Um, this is in 1990, I guess it was 1998, and uh, ended up acquiring uh, several several thousand vacant lots through the tax foreclosure program that the county had. So when you turn that project. Uh, let, let's say, unlike your, unlike your uh, development of the actual houses, when you turn that project, maybe you sell it to a developer who has an idea for that that area. Yeah. Where do the pro- yeah. Where do the proceeds go? The, the proceeds go back to the city. Yeah, the city the city uh, uses those uh, those land sales to support um, other redevelopment. They use it to uh, reimburse themselves for those uh, for those demolition costs. That's, that's, it's just really interesting. I, I remember when I first moved to Chicago and I heard about uh, lots, or maybe it was even homes, on Drexel, not that far away from the University of Chicago, selling for a buck. Mm-hmm. For a buck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not anymore. <laughs> no, certainly not anymore. And what, what, did yeah. you, what did you say was the interim step between the housing and the park district? What was that? Yeah, the, uh, I, was the, I was the first deputy commissioner in planning. Uh, so I was the number two guy in the planning department um, from '97 to '99, um, and was fortunate to be there at a time when um, this, the, the city was very uh, aggressive in uh, in its redevelopment efforts. Uh, uh, when I was there, we created, I think it was, we created 80 TIFs in about a two and a half year period. We we acquired several hundred acres of land. We we uh, this was during the first tech kind of boom. Uh, we, we we did a number of uh, redevelopment deals with tech companies. Um, we saw the emergence of the the start of the emergence of the West Loop, um, and uh, and uh, and then also parts of uh, Bronzeville and the near South Side. Well, for a tutorial for our uh, you know business listeners, and I, I have a music portion of this podcast too. Can you ex- explain the mechanics of tax in- increment financing a, a TIF and um, basically yeah. how it kind of works as an IOU for taxes? Just give us a little tutorial. Yeah, yeah. So, so TIF is, is uh, has been a uh, um, uh, very effective tool the city has used to um, to deal with some of the some of the extraordinary costs that relate to um, doing development in the city. And so the way it works is basically you create a, a geographic area, a district you designate it as a tax increment financing district. Um, there are certain qualifications that that area has to meet um, as it relates to uh, underutilized properties, deterioration, blight. Um, and, and so once you establish that TIF uh, district, um, the, the taxes that are currently being paid from that area continue to go to all of the taxing bodies, the school district, park district, all of the various taxing bodies. But then any new um, taxes that are generated through improvements or redevelopment in that area go into a, a, uh, a special fund. So if, uh, if you have an area and let's say the taxes in that area are paying a million dollars when you create the TIF and after two or three years you do some development, that that in, that uh, increases maybe two hundred thousand. That two hundred thousand dollars, so they're pay, it's paying one point two million now. That two hundred thousand goes into a fund that then can be used to support uh, infrastructure, site costs, acquisition costs, um, some of the um, uh, some of the site work uh, for particular projects within that district. Right. So uh, what uh, what many developers will do is they'll take that. That uh, income stream, that that TIF income stream, they'll they'll um, they'll bond off of that and and generate a note that then they can use to to finance um, some of those upfront costs. TIFs by by statute, by Illinois statute, are 23 years. That's uh, that's the statutory period of a TIF. Um, the city has extended TIFs. Um, you know, usually it's in increments of like 10 more years. 
Um, but the, the, the tips that, uh, that, that we were dealing with were, you know, were basically, we were still within the 23 year period. And, um, the one that, that did roll off when I was there was the central loop tip, wow. uh, which was hugely successful. Actually, we used it to, um, to develop uh, a number of the, um, of the theaters. So the, Oriental, the Ford, the the um, you know what was the was the Bismarck, um, and uh, and the Schubert. Those were all done um, as well as as uh, Orchestra Hall. Those were all done using central loop tip dollars. Yeah, very interesting. Our, our Lagrange Theater was the 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 same thing. And of course, my wife benefited yeah. being in the Chicago Symphony from what you did to what became Symphony Center with a Symphony Center. Yeah, yeah, million that million bucks. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, one of the larger tips we did, but uh, ultimately it was it was uh, very successful. I mean, we created uh, really a, a you know a destination for people. At, you know, prior to the the theater district, and um, there were very few people living downtown. There was not much nightlife. Uh, basically, the loop emptied out after um, you know, after five o'clock. Um, but uh, Mayor Daly's vision was really to kind of create this twenty four hour city, and and so getting. New residential, getting uh, theaters renovated, getting uh, nightlife, and cultural attractions uh, um, opened. Um, downtown was a, a central part of uh, the overall redevelopment. When uh, when that TIF, the, the central loop TIF expired, um, you know it it was a huge uh, windfall for the taxing bodies because after the 23 years, whatever that new basis is, uh, all starts to go back to the um, to the taxing bodies. Yeah, you know, I guess the um I guess the potential downfall is that in that 23 years you have no appreciation, like something that could have happened in Detroit or a few yeah. other depressed markets. Yeah, you know, you have to you have to make sure that where you're where you're creating tips you really do have kind of uh market activity and, and there is a uh a trajectory for uh for growth and appreciation. We were just talking about TIFs in a like a say a city like Detroit where they actually have deflation of prices. Is that did any of those occur with the cities? Yeah, there were there were a couple of TIFs that uh, that was actually uh, a negative increment, and uh, those were um, ultimately those were uh, detiffed, so the, the TIF was repealed. And it, were you in in this time in this interval of time where you're you're working with the city of Chicago? Were you also Highly involved in in the the changing and the approval of new zonings to allow new kind of things to occur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We as a, as the two deputy, I had a pretty wide portfolio, um, looking at uh, yeah zoning. Um, uh, there were there were uh, manufacturing districts that uh, that were created. Uh, we were able to get into some of these industrial corridors protected. Um, so there was a lot of emphasis on on uh, some zoning reform as well as uh, affordable housing. So I've had a I've had a property on the market in River North for a while um and it's been interesting to see the different kind of residential zonings that are in effect and how they determine parking and mm-hmm. the necess- the necessity for parking at the site. And if we're to develop a uh, do an uh, do an adaptive reuse to have you know, one of the great developers come in and and do apartment. Well, then we have X number of cars that have to be on the site. Yet if it's in this DX5, I think it is zone DX zoning, and we do a hotel, there's no demand for parking. And and, um, two episodes ago, we had Cedar Street's uh, surviving founding partner who talked about the fact that their micro units where they've gotten the most density have no parking requirements whatsoever. So I find that kind of change within the zoning that reflects the new trends in the the lack of automobiles on the younger buyers to be really interesting. Have you, did it yeah. ever come across your desk even way back when? Oh, yeah. No, we, we actually, the, the whole concept of DX zoning um, was created when I was, when I was in planning. Um, and uh, it was, it was done to, to provide both kind of more predictability, but also more flexibility um, as, as uses changed, as different product types changed. And so 
um, I think, uh, yeah, that was back in, you know, like the late 90s, early 2000s. And I think that uh, that trend has only uh, continued. And, and I think it will continue as we you know, as look at things like uh, ride sharing services, driverless cars. I think, um, you know, the whole issue around, uh, you know, uh, cars and, and uh, transportation, uh, I think, is going to continue to evolve. We had a. Uh, um... Uh, quite a few discussions about the Finkel steel plant and also the, the, that corridor, um, that industrial corridor over in the West Loop. Is it the uh, Kedzie, Kedzie Corridor? Is that yeah, what it's? Kinsey. Kinsey. Kinsey Corridor, right. Yep. Um, did, and I could see the intent there. Let's keep some sort of manufacturing jobs or light industrial here in the city. Yet, it, with this tidal wave and the quantum shift in, in the kinds of real estates that are around it, we've had, you know, the pitches from everything from the Amazon headquarters to new residential um, coming into those areas. Do you, uh, to, to be reflective about it, do you see that maybe the idea of keeping light manufacturing in or near the city was a mistake? Was it a, a necessary yeah. interim? Or, what do you see now in hindsight that these things are kind of being unwound? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I think that's, the, that's the wonderful thing about cities is they're always evolving, always changing. And I think, um, you know, for, for my time at the city, you know, uh, we were, we were both trying to kind of balance protecting, Kind of older manufacturing, older industry, and at the same time allowing for some of these new uses. Um, I think uh, some of the some of the early kind of encroachments in those industrial areas were auto dealers, um, which was a concession. Um, you had a, a you know you had um, auto uh, uh, dealers that wanted to be close to downtown, uh, really primarily for the service purpose, um, not even so much for the sales, but more for the service. And so those. Those started kind of popping up in these industrial areas, and then um, I think uh, I think what's happened over time is yeah, there's 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 higher and better uses now. Um, I do think that there are some of those kind of um, mission critical industries that, that do need to be protected. I think of like utility companies. I think of asphalt uh, or concrete plants that uh, have um, have commodities that are that are very much. Um, kind of site specific and need um, access to uh, both transportation as well as kind of the urban core. Interesting. So those those kind of things need to be protected. So you see a you see a real value in, for instance, the big Ozinga facility down by Armitage. Yeah, I mean it has to be there. I mean if they, you're you're making you know ready mixed concrete. It, you only have so much time to get it to market. Yeah, that's very interesting. And now when so. To sort of wrap up this Chicago city of Chicago, you know, chapter in in your career, you 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 actually weren't. Sounds like you weren't at planning and zoning that long before you were asked to step into the parks department. Did it make sense? Yeah. Did it make sense to you on your arc? Was it just a better paycheck? What what well, what drew it, you it, what it, drew you yeah. there in particular? Well, I think I think uh, you know it was the opportunity to, to kind of move up and, and to kind of run an agency. Uh, you know, uh, the park district uh, when I was there had about a six hundred million dollar budget, about three thousand employees. Um, I think I was. Uh, I was like 34 years old when I became superintendent of the park district. So, um, you know, very, very few kind of um, careers allow you those kind of opportunities at a young age. And so um, I was, I was fortunate to be uh, put into that position. And uh, again, it was a, it was a good time to be there. There were, the city had some resources, the park district had some resources, and there were some really important projects that, um, that I was able to be a part of. Now, see, for, forgive my ignorance here, but I, I mean, I think of the planning and zoning, urban planner, uh, public policy guy, uh, going in the direction you're going, but then seeing the park district as almost like a bureaucratic nightmare and just like policing public, yeah. policing public <laughs> land. Where, where was the, yeah, cre- where was the yeah. creative part of it for you that oh, said, well, Oh, well, I really you know, want to do this. Yeah, no, the, the park district is, in Chicago, is one of the most important kind of quality of life institutions in the city. I mean, uh, we have, uh, Chicago has over 300 parks. It's, it's got uh, uh, the lakefront. It runs um, all of the harbors, uh, seven golf courses. Uh, I mean, it's a very diverse um, 
portfolio that the, the park district has beyond just kind of running recreation programs. Mm. And, uh, and, um, it, it's also, um, yeah, it's very important when you're looking at, uh, when you are looking at planning to be able to have, uh, and build in, uh, open space opportunities, recreational opportunities. And so I really saw it very much as a kind of a continuation of my work, um, in planning and development. That's, that's a, I, I never knew about the harbors part. I always assumed that that was like New York, that that was going to be under the control of a public authority. Honestly, I never no. Huh? No, that's all under the that's all under the authority. The parking garages in Grant Park are, are owned and managed by the Park District. The, uh, um, you know, you've got of course Soldier Field, um, other 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 facilities that uh, the Park District owns. So it's a pretty wide ranging um, set of uh, of um, facilities and, and open space, and it's very diverse too. Even even the open space goes from uh, prairies and savannas and wetlands to uh, you know, turf and, and uh, uh, indoor facilities, field houses, lagoons. I mean, there's all there's all kinds of different uh, landscapes hmm. and um, uh, natural areas that the park district uh, manages. So, uh, Soldier Field. Some of my listeners that are Bears fans can blame you for their demise. Uh, the the uh, when, <laughs> no, don't put that. Up. <laughs> when did the um, when did the Millennium Park project come across? your desk and oh my yeah. gosh this this is on me what when did that happen what was the story yeah it, it it so it actually started when i was in the planning department um and what happened was that um the uh, the Illinois central railroad um was looking to um i think it was looking to merge with uh, canadian national and so they needed um, they needed city approval. Um, the the um, Interstate Commerce Commission was requiring local approval of that merger, and so um, some of the city's law- lawyers started looking at you know, what what kind of things we could uh, you know we could look to leverage as part of this acquisition, and um, realized that the air rights over the railroad tracks um, were something of value, and and so. It was really the, the 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 city's law department that that first kind of um, identified the the air rights as a as an important um, part of of uh, building this new park, and so that's kind of what got the ball rolling, and that that as that kind of advanced, um, you know, started looking at different plans, different opportunities, um, and uh, and then when I do get to the tech district. Um, it's really, really when things kind of started to ramp up and, and uh, more formal plans were put together. Um, and uh, as you probably know, the, the, the park kind of morphed in its design and its, um, and its intent over uh, you know, probably a three- or four-year period. Right. And now, now for our, again, for our listeners who aren't fluent with this terminology, we have air rights are literally the space that exists on top of your real estate in a space where nothing exists yet. So condominiums are yeah. so, condominiums are sometimes built on, in air rights over a lot that's been leased, for instance. And in your case, you had that very low bed of the train tracks. I, I took yeah. that. I have taken that train a few times. And what you're talking about is that almost in the way that Lower and Upper Wacker Drive had to come out of nothing way back when in Chicago history. You were going to develop a park over the top of what had been a very deep railroad bed and area. Yes, that's amazing. Yes. It's almost like building those yes. those cities in Star Trek that hang in the sky. Yeah, well, uh, you know, in 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 in, uh, in much of downtown, the the the, the, the rights to develop the, the vertical are more valuable than the than the ground. Correct. Um, and uh, and so the, there's a lot of value. And the, the railroads had really no value. They weren't going to use those air rights. And so, um, as part of the as part of the uh, merger, uh, the city was able to to get um, the railroad to basically donate those air rights. Uh, and then ultimately, a deck uh, was built over the railroad um, using those air rights. And that's largely uh, how we have Millennium Park. Yeah, and and. Um... Uh, uh, just another piece that would be so familiar to you that that was kind of amazing to me was that the the property I'm representing in River North is very short, and it had air rights that it could sell to the bank 
of air rights that the city owned where others could come and say, I want my building taller, so I'm going to build using some of the air rights I'm going to purchase from that four-story building in River North. It's an un- yeah. it's an unbelievable like option market of yeah. of air. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I think in in much of downtown, uh, you know, the value of the vertical is uh, is is many times more valuable than the the land it, itself. So uh, now now that we've sort of we've completed that sort of Chicago thing, and I, I I have to compliment you on Millennium Park, the the developer that I started in in real estate with, the senior partner, came out to see it when you were almost done. And for him, it was jaw-dropping. I think it was over a billion dollars in cost at that point. And he said he'd never seen anything like it. It would just, Hmm. um, everything from the Pritzker uh, pavilion Pavilion. to the, you know, to the bean that actually a client of mine, MTH Industries and Midwest Glass designed, which was fun. They weren't the architects, but they were the the builders. They're still maintaining it, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and it was... um, Everything about it just blew him away. He 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 said it it gave him you know create it got his creative juices going just to come and visit it and see it. So yeah, you know kudos it, it the um. But I want to back up into your story a little bit. I, I think I heard from I think it was from your mom one time saying that when you were first heading into either this Lawndale phase of your life or maybe your first city job, that you were were actually offered a pretty high-paying position in private industry, uh, mm-hmm. but that your wife really asked you, is this your mission? And and you right. ended up turning down that job. So that's a true story. Can you give a little a little back yeah. a little background to that? Yeah, I was uh, I was um, uh, I, I did a uh, I did a uh, internship when I was in college at the uh, Mercantile Exchange and uh, was uh, offered a, a position in options trading uh, with a um, fast growing um, Chicago commodities firm, and uh, and decided uh, that that really wasn't I didn't want to spend next 10 years in, uh, in the commodity pits and the mercantile exchange and wanted to do something a little more um, impactful with my life. And so I, I turned that down and uh, I went to grad school and, um, you know, started my, uh, started my career in community development. That's cool. Uh, the, um, what do you think it was? Was it the passion when you, when you start in community development, you, you end up in Lawndale, it's, it's a good fit. Was it, was it, Helping the people with the housing and the poor and the services, or was a, a, another driver stronger that was to c- kind of creatively problem solve? We can build this environment around them, and and we're going to totally improve the environment around them. Wh- which which was yeah, the stronger I was, pull? I think, was, I think it was it was both. I think I was certainly motivated by the the, the desire to serve and to to see things improve and and see communities benefit. Um, but also, you know, I think um, what's, what's kind of underlied a lot of, you know, my career has been, you know, trying to, to figure out solutions to complex urban problems. And um, uh, I, I do believe there are solutions. They're not always easy. They're not, they're not always um, politically correct or politically feasible. But um, I, I very much enjoy kind of the, uh, you know, the problem solving and, and kind of creative um you know, creative solutions that uh, uh, that motivate, you know, uh, a lot of our work and, and what we do. This is your host, John Hunter. If you, your company, or your organization would like to sponsor our real estate episodes, you can have an internal advertisement placed in the podcast. Please contact me at john at jhunterservices.com. Stages to success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo to play it by commanding Play Stages to Success Podcast. We're listening to an interview with David Doig, who spearheaded the building of the city of Chicago's Millennium Park while he headed the Park District. So you, when you were made supervisor of the Chicago Park District, did you start to see that, um, in addition to running all these harbors, and it still blows my mind, and these uh, other, you know, 
part and parcel of just keeping the place up and running. When did it become evident to you that, oh my goodness, I'm going to be basically administrating this Millennium Park project? Yeah, I, I knew that when I took the job. That was, uh, you know, that was kind of in the works, and so I knew that would uh, ultimately come under um, uh, come under our our kind of uh, and, uh So no, I, I was it was it was uh, very much kind of aware of that when I when I became super. So uh, you know, it it always strikes me whenever I'm in Millennium Park when I when I used to have my office downtown when I'm down down there that it, it's it's the most international center besides the airport in our city. Mm-hmm. You, you, yeah. hear, you hear more languages. Well, I have spoken Catalan, which is a language <laughs> I had to learn for work in that park. I mean, yeah. the, what are the uh, yeah. what are the, the people just about? Yeah. They just about yeah. fainted when I spoke with them. But yeah. Um, yeah. W- let's talk about just some of the iconic elements that that I mentioned before, because people do come from all over the world and have their their pictures taken. The cloud gate, the bean. How did you guys, how did you guys go about commissioning that, placing yeah. that, making a work of public art? What was the background there? The park was a um, was a work in progress from the very beginning. Um, Mayor Daly had asked a group of um, civic leaders to to lead the charge, and and uh, John Bryan, in particular, from Sara Lee, was the chair of the Millennium Park Committee, and uh, as as they were going around raising money, there there became a lot of excitement around various elements of the park. And so um, what happened was a lot of these donor groups got together and said, you know, we need more, we need more features. There needs to be more um, attractions to get people into the park. And so uh, things like the uh, the fountain, the crown fountain, the the, the bean, uh, Pritzker Pavilion, a lot of these were donor initiated. Um, elements that fortunately we had enough land and enough uh, flexibility to be able to accommodate those, but it was it was never planned, uh, you know, with all of these different pieces in place. That very much kind of evolved and, and developed as the park started to be um, built out. So you had you had private money seeking out these commissions for the the bean slash cloud gate, the the uh, Gary for the Pritzker Pavilion. You weren't necessarily integral to those commissions is that what you're saying no right right now we the, the, the city and the park district saw its role um to kind of uh, put the infrastructure in to kind of set the table so that those various donor driven elements could be accommodated and what about the fountains with the faces on it that spit water i, yeah. don't, I don't know a lot of the background of that but they're really cool yeah the um the uh the artist on that is uh was uh, his name is jaime Plensa, a spanish architect that um uh, the, the crowns actually commissioned and uh, built the built those water walls um, and and then uh, you know project kind of images through them. Really unique kind of a uh, element, but but one of the great pieces of the park where you know kids from all over the city can come and play and run through the water and and uh, it's a it is very much kind of a public park. Um, not only for international visitors, but but also for the the city as a whole. I mean, I, I'm always amazed with kids from, you know, and families from all over Chicago that come and enjoy Millennium Park. I um, The the Pritzker Pavilion and, and Geary's design of it, uh, I'm going to put as a, a link on this episode because uh, an architect friend of mine showed it to me because I was apologizing for how poorly I would draw when we walked through a space some of the concepts that we were discussing, and I'd always say, I'm no architect, Please forgive me. I draw like a five-year-old, and then they sent me pr- pr- um, uh, Gary's first, you know, thought sketches of the Pritzker Pavilion, and it's hysterical. Yeah. I, I just yeah. uh, that you know that is unbelievable that it turned out to be that. Did did yeah. you, did you in your heart of hearts? And you got yeah, t- you know, tell the truth here. It's a bunch of real estate guys, you know, listening and gals. Did you ever think when the, all these elements started to get put together that you had just developed like the king of kitsch park <laughs> and this place is going to yeah. be so weird that I'm going to be the laughing yeah. stock of the development world? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean there was a there was a high level of, you know, uncertainty and and suspicion about um, you know, about how this was going to work because I, I mean there had never been anything like it where you know, where you were literally kind of creating it as you were building it. Um, uh, you know, most, most parks, most kind of classic urban parks, whether it was Olmstead or, 
uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, uh, burn on plans or some of these other kind of, you know, large scale kind of public uh, park plans. You know, they were well thought out. They were they were very intentional. There was a lot of um, thought given to kind of, you know, where where you place various things. Uh, it was just the opposite one. With Millennium Park, it, it was it was it was very much kind of a, uh, you know, an organic, you know, um, effort that that really, uh, you know, really worked kind of um, symbiotically as as the owners got interested and in, in, involved. Um, you know, you, you kind of created these rooms where they could kind of have their various commissions and and uh, and. and uh, facilities kind of highlighted but but it wasn't planned that way it wasn't it wasn't that intentional it was uh it happened really uh, over the course of, of several years as the park started well and, and it is a it's a totally different concept dave if i you know if you go to central park of olmstead or the montreal one in montreal it, it you do have that sort of classic park feeling doric columns uh uh ponds landscaping that you know gives you this the you know, overall feeling and when you're in when you're in Millennium Park it's like you're at various stations of of wonder i i, I went to a concert that my son sang in where they put together it was about 1000 1200 different singers from all the professional and college choruses around over where the bean was and mm-hmm. you realize, okay, it's you've got that little epicenter. You go to the Pritzker Pavilion, and it's its own epicenter. You go to that yeah. snake bridge. You go to that garden, that secret garden, the Japanese garden. And there's there's yeah. all these little separate areas that are, are unbelievably original, and that's what makes it cool. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 you know, I mean, uh, you've got you've got the the, the 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 very classic kind of peristyle on the northwest part of the park. You've got this kind of um, fun, uh, you know, interactive uh, crown crown fountain. You've got the very interesting and I think engaging, you know, cloud gate, the the, the Pritzker Pavilion, and then you also have on the on the southeast part, you've got the Lurie Gardens, which are uh, harkening back to some of those more formal English gardens with hedgerows and and uh, native grasses and so forth. So it's it's an amazing combination of of various um, architectures and landscapes that, you know, I don't know that anybody thought it was going to work as well as it, it has, but, but it's, it's part, part of its kind of uniqueness is that it, it is organic and it happened, uh, it happened really um, uh, through happenstance and not through intention. Do you, um, uh, you're going to, you're going to give away all the credit on the creativity and hand it off to the uh, individual donors and commissioners and committees. But I, I find that an amazingly creative piece of something like this is the dollars, the financing. Mm-hmm. How, yeah. how deep, how deep in the weeds did you get with financing this thing and planning out oh, the yeah, dollars and cents? A, yeah, no, that was, that was the, that was the challenging part. I think, um, you know the the donors certainly were were a huge, um, you know, really essential part of of the park and contributed hundreds of millions of dollars um, of philanthropic um, resources to to the build out of the park. Um, the the harder part was was paying for that uh, infrastructure, and so uh, we actually we used uh, revenue from the parking lots below to basically finance a lot of the infrastructure. So we did we did uh, we did parking lot uh, uh, parking revenue bonds that ultimately um, you know was uh, was used to pay for the infrastructure that was what created the the uh, uh, the bridge and the um, the the deck over the railroad um, so that was kind of the, the the public's contribution we also were able to use some TIF money from the city to help with uh, some of those infrastructure costs but. Um, of course, every time the donors decided they wanted to add a new element, they were willing to play, pay for the stuff you could see. What they were not willing to pay for, which ultimately we had to finance, was the stuff um, that you couldn't see. So, in you know, like in the case of the, the Crown um, Fountain, uh, there's a whole subsection of the, of the um, parking garage that had to be dedicated for pumps 
and additional support systems mm-hmm. that was never contemplated when the park was first laid out. Yep, and I mean, you throw around you throw around the word bonds, and so a great majority of our, our the listeners are just all they're going to know is that somehow it's related to stocks, but it's different. Uh, but I don't really know what a bond is, and I know that you and I have talked in depth about bonds. But uh, it, again, it's like a thirty-second tutorial. You're really gathering an IOU for future proceeds of that parking lot. Just how do you buy? Correct. How do you borrow against yeah. that? Well, you 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 have to co- convince the underwriters that uh, there's sufficient revenue to support the debt. Uh, a bond is really nothing more than a than a debt instrument. Um, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a tool that municipalities use to um, to build infrastructure, and so they'll they'll float debt through the issuance of bonds that um, is supported by um, you know in most cases it's supported by by general tax revenue. In the case of Millennium Park, it was a revenue bond that was was tied directly to the um, the parking revenue underneath the the the, um, the park itself. It's cool, man. I, the, the only bonds I've had to deal with were industrial revenue bonds that allowed yeah, something to happen. Yeah. But uh, uh, even that, I just watched from afar. And, uh, you know, when you get into the these very, uh, you know, very intentional, long-range real estate financing things, I kind of stand back in amazement. Uh you, I, I want to shift over now to your bank, the the banking part of your career. You, when I first knew of you, you were involved with the First Bank of Oak Park and Mr. Yep. Kelly, correct? Yeah, yeah. First Bank of Oak Park, yep. And, and uh, Park National was the the local branch for the um, for the uh, bank holding company. And uh, so, yeah, so I joined uh, I joined Park National in um, in two thousand and seven uh, after. Uh, finishing at the Park District, then had done a couple years of, of private development that we talked about, um, and then joined uh, uh, joined Park National to, to to really head the kind of community development activity that uh, that Mike Kelly was uh, was interested in pursuing. Um, you know, starting uh, in in, uh, in Pullman on the far south side. So you, uh, even though even though he was located up there in. Um in Oak Park, and I and I and your development was happening in Oak Park. Uh, when I when I met you, I, I think it was that at that office, you already had those um, conceptual boards of the Ryerson property and the, yeah. the Pullman area. Yeah. So you really yeah. were targeting the far south side at at that yeah. point. Yeah, Mike had Mike had purchased in in the early two thousands. Mike had purchased what was then the the Pullman Heritage Bank and a couple of other south side banks and. Um, it put them kind of under the Park National banner, and so he was really interested in using the bank as a platform to spur uh, community development. Okay, so that 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 explains the uh, the that big sort of isolated bank building that I I met with you at um, down there and on the far south side. Um, mm-hmm. The but you know our listeners don't have to be economic geniuses to know that you're dealing with basically some collateralized debt debt instruments and obligations and it's 2007. So mm-hmm. in one year uh the name Mike Kelly which I uh, you know I had always heard of just glo- glowingly and I think you would still talk him ab- about him that way. Oh yeah. All of a That's sudden true. he gets caught in in that raging storm at sea that was 2008. Yeah. And yeah. um how I mean, did you think to, uh, you're going to have to go home to your wife and say we're going to get completely wiped out here? And and Mike's being I I, I forget was he in, in, indicted or convicted? Uh, we're going to go down with the ship here. What what was yeah, what yeah. was the whole thing? Oh, what, yeah, so so you know what what happened? Um, you know, really was uh, was uh, a uh, you know a series of very kind of unfortunate events and and. Um, you know, most of it's most of it's public that um, that uh, you know Mike had um, had built uh, uh, the bank holding company FBOP up to the point where um, in the mid 2000s uh, it was the largest uh, it was the largest privately owned bank in America um, and it was it was 100 percent owned by Mike um, had assets of over 20 billion dollars and um, 
you know, and Mike was uh, was brilliant in assembling uh, troubled banks, uh, rehabilitating them, and then and then repositioning them, and kind of integrating them into this this bank holding company. Um, but uh, in 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 2007, 2008, Mike had um, you know made the unfortunate uh, decision to put a lot of the bank stock in uh, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, which is was something that was both um, suggested and encouraged by the by the government. Um, and so, when 2008 came and uh, both of those um, entities collapsed, uh, that that left the bank undercapitalized. And um, uh, over the course of about a year, um, the bank ended up failing, uh, and uh, and the complete um, assets of of the bank holding company were uh, acquired by U.S. Bank. So, yeah, so there were a couple of very uh, uh, stressful years. Uh, I wasn't sure whether we were going to still be around, whether we were going to be able to continue our, our activity. Um, but I will say, you know, really to the credit of U.S. Bank, that they came in very early uh, after acquiring Park National and saw the value in what we were doing, um, you know, encouraged us to kind of stay the course and uh, ultimately helped us launch Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives um, as a separate entity uh, out from under U.S. Bank in uh, in mid-2010. So you had the, I mean, you've balanced this public-private thing for quite a number of years now, and, and U.S. Bank allowed you to basically, let's say, keep your vision yeah, and, yeah, they, they, and they, un- they, they, underwrote the risk. You know. Right. They ultimately, uh, you know, they ultimately donated our balance to us. That was kind of the, that was kind of the kickstart and startup capital that, that, that we used to, to start and grow um, Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives. So when in, when in 2010, uh, then it's, two, it's probably a little over two years that I had met with you and you showed me what you were going to be doing with this Ryerson takeover and the large retail piece of it that was, uh, was it a Menards? Was it a Home Depot? Walmart. Walmart, yeah. sorry. Walmart, sorry. Yep. And, yep. and then the swath of 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 affordable housing, just a gigantic amount. Yeah. When you're looking at this, and now it's 2010, and there's a new entity, yeah. new entity calling the shots. Did you feel like I've just put, and uh, th- this is actually really well balanced against the Pabst Brewery episode that I just did. Did you feel like, wow, all my creativity's on the line. This dream, this pitch, th- you know, these industries that that have to come alongside in order to make it? Did you feel like you were teetering on Mount Everest, or did you just feel like, I'm going to get this done? <laughs> well, I'm going to get this well, done. Well, you know, you know it's so, yeah, so the, the Ryerson Steel site, uh, you know, it, it was a 180-acre site, one of the largest kind of contiguous um, sites in the city of Chicago. Um, you know, we, we, we knew that, you know, this was going to take years to develop, and so, you know, like anything, you kind of start with a phased approach, uh, getting Walmart was was by far the most important thing, kind of kicking that off and and uh, being able to to leverage that for then additional retail. Um, uh, you know what that that was kind of the jump start we needed to to kind of get things going. what What has happened now, you know in the last you know seven, eight years is um, uh, despite our you know best plans and 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 good intentions, you know the the housing market just has not come back. And so, while we while we originally had several thousand units of new housing proposed, um, you know we've in essence jettisoned that and um, have really kind of refocused and pivoted um, on on uh, on using the land that we have for industrial development. Mm-hmm. And that so, that's your new Whole Foods warehouse, I take it. Yeah. So we did uh, our first industrial deal. We did was uh, Method Method Home Method Soap, um, and uh, delivered that about three and a half four years ago. Uh, and then uh, most recently this January opened uh, the new Midwest Distribution Center for Whole Foods. So, so, it, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to give our, our context that, you know, our um, listeners a context who aren't from Chicago. The, the area you're talking about, this Pullman area that's very famous because of the, the Pullman uh, rail factories and everything we're talking about uh, let's give or take 111th street right south yeah, 111th and i-94 right and roughly. um and as you know i you mean i i worked on a deal there for for the the building that was the the assembly main assembly of the 
kind of the the ultra designer cars that Pullman built. Um, right. It's yeah, it's an it's an, an amazing area, and you're rebuilding sort of the. I'd like to call it sort of the whistle stop downtown with almost a little city hall. And, you know, you got, you got federal designations. Is that right? As a national yeah, historic yeah, site? Yeah, we're a national, national park now. Yes. We, uh, President Obama designated Pullman a national park in 2015. And so we're working with the park service to, to build out um, some of the historic buildings and, and redevelop those. Um, you know, we're starting to, we are starting to see uh, more um, interest in neighborhood retail. We opened uh, our first kind of new restaurant. We have a pot bellies now. And, and uh, so we're, we're starting to see some other kinds of, uh, of retail happen. So our, our, you know, all in, we've, we've uh, coordinated about uh, a little over $250 million of development in the last six or seven years, mm-hmm. created over 1,400 new jobs. Um, and, uh, and really as a, as a nonprofit, the development uh, corporation, um, our our group, Chicago Neighbor Initiatives, is really focused on on the mission of uh, improving the quality of life in in the neighborhood, as well as bringing jobs and economic opportunity to the residents that live there. You know that Rahm Emanuel's not running, right? So I'm just putting that. I in do there. know that. Yeah, I'm just I, I'm, I'm, really I'm just hearing you, Dave. I'm just hearing the. Uh, <laughs> I'm hearing perfect candidates speaking here. Anyway, for for just again to put it in context for for you know people national people who aren't in the area, I think I think of Pullman as sort of a, a great outlier to the South community, almost in, in Indiana, a uh, very s- separate, and mm-hmm. then about. Uh, at 111th is the pulmonary, but you get back into the uh, the 50s, 60s, and 70th South, and it's the Englewood community where, as you know, yeah. I've done a lot of work. And, yeah. and yeah. there, at the same time as all these things are going on, you're somehow involved in in the, the, the processes of getting the very first Whole Foods into a completely blighted community, uh, yeah. uh, Englewood. Uh, and yep. that is part and parcel of Chicago. I mean, it's a direct bleed in from the downtown. A, yeah. a Starbucks, the, you know, the kind of, um, let's call it conjoining of the Kennedy King College campus right into that whole right. thing. How the heck did you get involved in that when you're doing all this yeah. other stuff? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that, that was part of, uh, part of our legacy actually with Park National is we had, uh, we had done. Um, uh, we had built about a hundred new homes uh, in Englewood in partnership with St. Bernard Hospital um, back in the early 2000s, and so we had a, a long uh, history. And actually, um, uh, we have a bank uh, at 63rd and Hall. Said it was it was a Park National Bank. Now it's the U.S. Bank uh, branch, and so there was a, there was a strong commitment on the part of, uh, of Mr. Kelly, and um, and then. Uh, our board um, to seeing things happen in Englewood. And so uh, when, um, after Kennedy King was done, um, uh, I, I, uh, one one day early in his tenure, Mayor Manuel was out at Kennedy King and, and uh, was looking kind of west across Halstead and saw this vacant parcel and um, uh, reached out to his planning commissioner, Andy Mooney, at the time and said, you know what? With all this investment in this new college, you know, why can't we get something going on the 13 acres that the city owns across the street? And so Andy reached out to, to, to me, having known our work in, in Pullman, and said, hey, would you take a look at this? And it just so happened that, that uh, Mayor Emanuel at the same time had been, had been talking to Walter Robb, the CEO of Whole Foods, about doing something um, in, a, in a food desert. The mayor was very interested in, in ameliorating um, some of the food deserts in Chicago. And so those two kind of pieces came together. We, we put together a plan, went back to the city, showed them how we could, uh, we could develop the, the, the whole food site. And, um, and uh, the whole foods has been open a couple of years now. And uh, we guess there's a Starbucks, a Chipotle, um, and, uh, you know, by all kind of accounts, uh, things are going well at the corner of 63rd and Halstead. Yeah, and if you would have told me that uh, while you were developing uh, developing it, that Amazon was going to be the new owner of Whole Foods, I would have laughed you out of the room. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's... Um, it's amazing, Dave, because you know, as as you know, I've represented Chicago Public Radio, which is why I do the podcast down here. And yeah. your, your thing, uh, your project, 
for Whole Foods in that area was really central and core to Natalie Moore, whose uh, bureau I did on the South Side, not only for her reporting, but for her book. And, yeah, yeah, South Side. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it is... Um, What's happening there is, I, I'm not sure that the rescue is imminent. We're talking about Englewood that was over 100,000 people with lots of jobs two, yeah. ge- two generations ago. It's about 25, 26 now, Okay, now, but, but it's still significantly depopulated. And, and I think, um, you know, I think maybe to put on my public policy hat and, and uh, maybe offer a charge to, to the next mayor, I, I really think uh, what, you know, what needs to happen um, you know, on, on large uh, areas of the south and west side, is, there, there's got to be a focus on repopulating. Um, you know, you can only support retail and industry and, and commercial development if if you have a population center. And, and so um, I, I really think, uh, you know, whoever the next mayor is has got to, to figure out a way to develop some some new housing. Um, it, it could be using different building techniques, different materials, but uh, we've got to find a way to, to, to bring people back to the to the neighborhoods. Yeah, and you know, I, I I don't know if you subscribe, but you know, as a managing broker, right? I've I've gone to all these classes in New York and here, and and kind of the basic formula they always throw out to you is retail follows rooftops, which follows in- yeah. industrial, and. Yeah. That the the job center that creates that hub that people want to live around, uh, you know the the employment. I I I guess I I'm not buying into the fact that private industry has to drive all of that. There has to be some sort of incentiviza- incentivization for yeah. the industry to make that leap back into those areas. Yeah. Um, well, it's 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 a it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. I mean, you know, you, you, you've got to have you've got to have the rooftops, you've got to have the density, you've got to have the population center to be able to support the retail, uh, to give industry the confidence that this is a good place to to do business. And uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, you have to have industry willing to you know to to step out and pioneer and, and be willing to to kind of take those risks, mm-hmm. but. I do think that's, you know, there is a role um, that the public sector can play. I mean, I, if you think about a place like Englewood, I mean, the city of Chicago is the largest landholder in Englewood. It, it owns several thousand vacant lots. Crazy. We make those available at no cost to developers for, um, you know, uh, innovative, cost-effective, affordable housing types. Let's 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 make Chicago, let's rebuild Chicago's neighborhoods much the way uh, – uh, Chicago invented the bungalow in, in uh, the post-war post-war area. We, we should have a a new uh, bungalow program for rebuilding, you know, the south and west side. One thing is, I I'm, I'm making a couple sales in Dalton right now, and you know, I get involved in some recovery of buildings in the far south. Every mm-hmm. time I drive by that lower harbor area that basically sits completely undeveloped between the Indiana border all the way up to you know, really all the way up to your Ryerson location. Yeah. I hear a lot of stories. Uh, I hear a lot of uh, apocrypha, I will say, that, you know, the union stopped, you know, that from being developed because it wasn't within the city and blah, blah, blah. I hear a lot of finger pointing. What What do you think is the key to that unbelievably underused yeah. waterfront? What needs to yeah, happen? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, I mean, the, that, that most of that land is controlled by the Illinois Port Authority. Um, you know, one time our, our port was the center for commerce. Really, it was the, the most, um, uh, it was the highest used inland port in America. Um, that was where, you know, uh, the steel industry got its coal and iron ore. Um, and, you know, that's been degraded. It's been disinvested. It's, it's, it's deteriorated. Um, so I think, I think it starts with the port. I mean, you have to, you have to, to rebuild the port. Um, you've already got the infrastructure there. Uh, all five of the Class A railroads have facilities that lead into the ports. Uh, you've got the you've got the, the the highway infrastructure already there. Um, you know, I often say, uh, you know, there really there really is no place in North America that has the confluence of rail, water, and road that we have uh, in the in the Grand Canyon area. Um, and so, when you're thinking about transportation, logistics, uh, warehousing. 
uh, you know, there's no place in America better positioned, at least from a uh, infrastructure standpoint, than uh, than that area. Well, you know, I'll, on my next trip back to my dad's hometown of Belfast, maybe I can f- find the guy that revitalized that harbor and bring him yeah. here. And I want to thank you. Thank you for your time, Dave. It's it's sure. en- it's enlightening. It sh- it just shines the light into a lot of uh, you know misunderstood and and not well understood functions of of uh, public private work financing projects. It's been a fascinating hour. Yeah. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Dave. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with David Doig, a mover and a shaker, implementer, and change agent for Chicago's toughest and most renowned real estate. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier. Join us again for People and Stories from the Worlds of the Symphony Orchestra and Commercial Real Estate for our next episode of Stages to Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. success.